Before we get into a great interview today, I want to encourage you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at samconan.com. When you subscribe, not only will you receive free email updates from my website, you'll also get access to several other great resources available only to my subscribers on a special resources page. On that page, there is an ebook, The Goodness of the Ordinary Life, which explains why ordinary life is worth celebrating rather than escaping. Another ebook called Awakening the Moral Imagination Through Fairy Tales, a book about literature and in, in educating and engaging the imagination, especially of children, but also of adults. And then also a classical education audio package. It has six great lectures, uh, one of them by Greg Valeriano, the person we're going to be interviewing today, um, and then a bunch of other uh, lectures from me and, and one other of my colleagues. To subscribe, go to samconan.com slash subscribe. It'll take you to this page right here. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter or through RSS, but the only way to get the ebooks and audio is to subscribe to my free newsletter, so sign up today. Everything is completely free, and you can unsubscribe anytime you wish. So I'll talk to you soon. Now enjoy the interview. To samconan.com, I'm here with Greg Valeriano, one of my colleagues at Petra Academy, um, and we're going to interview him today because earlier this year, he gave a great talk uh, called The Shape of Classical and Christian Education uh, and delivered it at our uh, Teachers Education Conference. Uh, and you'll be able to download it um, at the bottom of this blog post. But I wanted to ask him a few questions to dig a little deeper into his talk. So Greg, uh, we've been working together for uh, forever, it feels like. Um, but you're still older than I am, so that's good. Uh, but just tell us a bit about your background. You have a pretty, uh, pretty eclectic background. Sure. Um, let's see. Education-wise, I went to a public high school, so I had a public education. And um, after that, I went to a Bible college, a small Bible college in New Jersey. That is now uh, defunct, and I was the last graduating class, so it's quite an academic achievement there. Yeah. Um, after that, I went to Wheaton and did a master's degree. It, it was, as you say, eclectic, Bible, uh, theology, church history, philosophy. Mm -hmm. Just tried to take as many courses as I possibly could. And then after that, I went to Princeton Theological Seminary and did a master's of divinity there. And that took a, took a few years to get done. <clears throat> and then after that, I spent some time both teaching and studying at Labrie Fellowship in Switzerland. And nice. now I teach, well, I've as you said, I've taught here at Petra. I think we're going on 11 years now. Um, yeah. And I also uh, teach at uh, Montana State University, and that's been about 10 or 11 years as well. So, Yeah, great. So, uh, yeah, so that's about, education-wise, that's about it. Sure. For, for those of us who don't know, um, some of our audience may not know, can you tell us about Libri a little bit? <clears throat> what were you yep. doing more specifically? Sure. Uh, Labrie Fellowship was started by Francis Schaefer, Francis and Edith Schaefer, his wife. And it was started initially for, uh, it was a kind of a missionary endeavor to kind of the lost, I don't know, generation of hippies uh, that were coming over from America and to Europe to travel and, and whoever else uh, that was coming. And it was an outreach to them. And Shaper tried to meet them on their own ground through philosophy and through art and literature and things like that. Um, so so Liberty has that background, and it still functions in that way uh, for the most part. But it's just a place for people to go and study and to learn, and but also to live in community. Mm. So it's a, it's a unique educational experience. It's a unique place, and I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to go. Yeah, and from our conversations, that experience uh, seems to have definitely shaped you. Yeah, I think my experience was similar, somewhat similar to Shaper's, if I uh, could put it that way. You know, Shaper's coming and he, when he became a Christian, he became a Christian, I think it's safe to say, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but it's a fundamentalist Christianity. And, but he started to see that this fundamentalism, there was plenty of things wrong with it. And one of, one of the things that was wrong with it was how they engaged or chose, uh, lack of engagement with culture around them. And so he realized that uh, to be able to reach the culture, he needs to be able to study that culture, its philosophy, its literature, its film, and all these things. And it's kind of, I've had a similar experience when I started reading Schaefer and I went to Labrie. Yeah, it was a, it was a, um, 
a uh, it was just a shift in mentality for me, and I learned uh, that Christians could, in good faith, engage in culture and learn from culture and watch films and listen to music that wasn't Christian, and do so in a way that loves God and 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 lo- loves our neighbors. So yeah, so it's it's big big influence on me. Excellent, for sure. And that um, all of that influence shows up in this talk that you gave. Mm. Um, so let's get, let's get into that talk a little bit. Sure. Um, we're just gonna. I'm. I just r- phrase some questions, frame some questions based on the talk, and. Um, sure. <clears throat> so the first one is is this, which ties in with what you just said. So you talk in your uh, about the dangers of secular classicism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So can you define that, and then just explain how Christians can be easily attracted to a kind of a secular classicism, especially mm-hmm. if they're new to classical education. Sure. Uh, could I take those in reverse order? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I think what makes Christians attracted to classical education or classicism, as you put it, is this, and this has been my experience, but I've talked to many people and it's, it's been a similar experience, is that one, when they come in contact with, say, you know, the Omnibus program that we use here or some kind of great books program, they, first of all, they realize, wow, I didn't have this. I didn't have this in my education. And they realize that there there's something severely lacking in in, in uh, their educational experience, so I think they see that, and then so they're they're attracted to this rich heritage of literature and philosophy and art, and and I think they get taken by it. They get taken by the beauty of it. They get taken by the rigor and the substance of it, and I think they get taken as well. At least I know I I have been taken by the beauty of it. Right. And so, so they just so they latch on to this, and it's certainly out of good motives, um, for sure, absolutely. But but classicism itself, or classical education itself, is just it's just not sufficient. Yeah. So I think they're attracted to it because of a lack of they had in their own education, and then they just see just the beauty of our our heritage, and if they look closely, the ugliness as well. But they see the beauty of it and the power of it, and they're attracted, to it, and they want to know more. They want to read more. So I think that's why Christians can be attracted to it, and, and non-Christians as well. But I think the problem with secular classicism is, is hinges on this word secular. Sure. Um, and I think in this sense, the word secular, the notion secular, as we understand it today, seems to stem from the Enlightenment period, mm-hmm. where, where the Enlightenment period wanted to to form a kind of um, space, a secular space that was devoid of any religious prejudice and be able to look at things from a, a neutral, you know, unprejudiced perspective. And, and that's, well, from, that's a problem. And I think it's a problem in two ways. One is, one is there is no neutral perspective. We all come with presuppositions. We all come, I don't know, this is the right way to put it, the philosophers might say theory-laden perspectives, you know, however you want to say it. And so there's no such thing as a neutral perspective, and, and I think most people today would agree with that. So that's one problem and one danger. Um, sure. But the other is that it's just simply, I mean, even if there were a neutral perspective, that's not an option for a Christian. Right. A, a Christian has to view things from a Christian perspective, from a biblical perspective, or if you will, a biblical worldview. So, so, the, word, so the, the approach of secular classicism just, well, it's just isn't adequate. Okay, and it, and it puts up a false ideal as to how we actually perceive things. So, so yeah, I think that's how to answer that question briefly. Okay, so, thanks. So, yeah. yeah. So, so how is classical Chris, uh, Christian classicism different from secular? Yeah, I think the big thing. I think the big thing is that the primary, the primary goal of a classical Christian education. Uh, is that is an immersion in a, in a Christian worldview. It's a, it's a biblical immersion. And I mean, we're just, you know, classical education, we're just school teachers, so we can't take this full burden on ourselves. You know, they, uh, students have parents. Uh, if they're Christians, they should go to, be going to church, right? But we help in this biblical immersion so that they see things from a biblical perspective hmm. based on biblical principles and, and, and then and then evaluate from there, and then evaluate from there. So I think that's one of the big things that makes uh, Christian classicism different. I mean, I guess you could say as well, if you wanted, you know, we're, we're trying to, uh, we're not trying to make just brainiacs, we're trying to form character as well. 
Right. So, so. And that's, that's, of course, one of the huge mis- misconceptions about classical education, that we're a bunch of elite, elitist eggheads. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, we have Latin, so we're trying to yeah. get everyone into Harvard. And, yep. And really, it's about shaping and forming character and uh, yeah, sh- could, shaping yeah. loves. Yeah, absolutely. I could care less about Harvard. I, I, my dream is to have um, you know someone who likes to work on cars, who who wants to take over their parents' farm, but you know reads Milton at night, nice. and and loves the Lord. You know that's that's what we're after. I think. Yeah. So great. So uh, you also talk about um, Patrick Deenan and his mm-hmm. critique in um, mm-hmm. uh, First Things a while mm-hmm. ago, mm-hmm. and he he critiques the great books approach to culture. Uh, mm-hmm. which is exactly the type of approach we have to humanities. But his critique is that it leads, it tends to lead to relativism, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. These um, the students study all of these different perspectives and they're mm-hmm. all given equal weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the students tend to assume that all truth is relative. Yeah. yeah. So, so obviously you don't agree with Deenan because that's what you teach. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the approach you teach. But is there anything to his critique? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think, uh, I think Deenan hits the nail on the head when it comes to this great books approach, especially if, if we see great books as a synonym for secular uh, classicism, okay? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, you know, you have this, uh, this view that, that students will come and have a kind of neutral perspective on things and be able to, you know, decide what's right or wrong, true or false, and, and all of this. But I, mean, I think Deenan is right that students don't come from a neutral perspective. They come from a culture that is highly individualistic and highly relativistic. And so when they approach these texts, I mean, there are two things going on. First, like you said, they're, they are presented as these kind of individual coherent wholes. So they're each of them are rationally incoherent within themselves. And there's no way to distinguish between any of these, which is true or false. They're all inherently or rationally coherent. But then students come with this individualistic and relativist perspective, and so they just think, well, okay, I'll just choose what I happen to like or what I happen to agree with or whatever floats my boat. And that just, that just you know, and it seems to me that secular classicists and secular uh, approaches to great books, they're trying to, under, they're trying to defeat relativism, but they're, they're, they're buying right into it, right. unwittingly. They're supporting it. Um, so I think that uh, so I think I think that's roughly Deenan's critique, sure. and um, and I think he's right about that. I think he's right about that. So so how would we? How do you avoid producing relativists or or skeptics, which is yeah. the other side of the picture? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a tough question. I think one thing is that you could just simply point out. Listen, uh, they might be inherently uh, coherent if if that's possible, uh, but they can't all be right. Nietzsche right. and Saint Paul are not. One of them's wrong, right? And uh, and they and they both want you to see that. Okay, so so you can kind of point out the the worldviews that have uh, contradictions, such that they both can't be right. right. Um, so I think that's one general idea. But I think it gets back to this biblical immersion, yeah, and and just training them in the biblical story, getting them to see from a biblical perspective. Um, so I think. I don't know. That's kind of, I don't know. I hope that answer is helpful. But I think that's the key. I think it's the key. It's this biblical immersion. It's not, yeah. it's not this. It's not like, oh, let's read, uh, let's read uh, Nietzsche and Rousseau and Milton and these guys and the Bible along and just kind of set the Bible in, uh, amidst all these other worldviews as if they're all equally plausible. No, you see from the biblical worldview it first, because that is a prime importance, that is a prime truth, and then you go evaluate to see what is true and what is good and what is beautiful in these other worldviews. So I think right. biblical immersion, again, is the key. It's the key. So. Yeah, good. But it's not just a unidirectional type of thing, right? It's not, you, you put the worldview in place, and then we, we use that worldview and analyze all the other texts, but the texts never speak back to that worldview. Yeah. And, yeah, no, I totally agree, and I um, I think this is something that we both, uh, I think, get a little disgruntled about sometimes. Yeah, it, you know, a classical education it functions as, as well as does a Christian worldview with this notion of antithesis, right? There's a fundamental, there are fundamental presuppositions that, that we have that help, that help us to view the world correctly and view it differently than, say, non-Christian per- perspectives, 
And um, but that doesn't seem, you know, that doesn't mean that non-Christian perspectives can't see the truth or see beauty or see goodness. And certainly it doesn't mean because we're Christians, we have this omniscient perspective on the world that we see all truth and all goodness and all all beauty. We're fallen. We're right. fallen. So we have to have this balance of recognizing one that we're fallen. And so there are things we're not going to see. And on the other hand, the old these people who are non-Christians, that they are non-Christians and they function with different presuppositions that that in some sense blind them from the truth, right? It doesn't completely blind them. And so they might see things that we don't see. They might have uh, things that we can learn from. So it is a fine right. line, but it's, I think it's, cru- I think it's critical. I think, I think there can be trends in classical education where this antithesis is too strong. Right. And so, so it becomes, as you say, unilateral and not bilateral. If yeah. That's the right way to put it. Right. Yeah. And common grace plays a huge role. Yeah. Common grace, the image of God. These are fundamental and important doctrines to Christians and, but also to classical Christian education. So right. we want to train our students, even when they look at Nietzsche. Okay. What does Nietzsche have to offer? They might not have a, offer, a lot of love to offer us, right? right? But they might have some criticisms that we can say, oh, that, that hits home a little, little too close. And so we have to take that seriously. Great. Yeah, and that goes right to the next question. Um, you mentioned in your talk the importance of exposing students to the, to the best of the worst. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what do you mean by that phrase, and why is that so important? Yeah, maybe I should rethink that phrase. It sounded good at the time. Oh, but uh, the, or, If you don't want it, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. I, I think a couple things here. First of all, I don't, and I don't think classical Christian education wants to coddle their students, especially their Christian students. And, you know, protect them from any danger that might be lurking out there in the great books that we read. Right. I think we need to expose them, to, as I said, to the best of the worst, you know, to the Nietzsche's, to the Freud's, the Marx's, whoever, you know, to whatever postmodern thinkers or whatever might be out there. We need to expose them because uh, these, these thinkers, are, they're not dummies. And right. we have to be prepared to be able to at least offer some kind of uh, articulate and winsome response to their criticisms. So yeah. we, I think part of classical education is preparing them for that and exposing them to it. Because this leads me to the other thing. Sometimes I've seen this in my own experience where Christian students haven't been exposed to that kind of stuff and then they go and get exposed to it and they feel gypped. And they right. feel gypped. And so they, then they can't trust what they've been taught and they can't trust the people who taught them. And so, you know, I, I mean, a prime example would be, I think, something along these lines would be C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was, early in his uh, education, was taught that, right, it's either Christianity or, you know, cl- classical, classical works, right? Christianity has all the truth. Classical works have nothing to offer, right? And they have, by way of critique or otherwise— and, um, and he, just, he just took that, and he's like, well, that doesn't make sense. And so at a young age, he just went with the non-Christian, the classical side. Right. And I think that um, if we don't expose our students and be honest with them, that there are difficult challenges out there to the Christian faith, and that there are things that we can learn from these non-Christian thinkers, if we don't get them to see that, that and, and, then, and then they come across these uh, thinkers, I, I, think I think they're going to... I think they're gonna they're gonna be bitter. They're gonna be jaded. They're gonna they're gonna say, "Wait a minute, I, I, this right. is what I was taught. It's not true." Right. And so they're not gonna trust what they've been taught. They're not gonna trust the people who've taught them. Exactly. So I so I think for a couple reasons that's why we expose our ch- our kids to the best of the worst. Right. We yeah. have to prepare them. We have to prepare them. Right. And yeah. be honest with them. Sorry. Right. Yeah. And you know, presenting our neighbor. I mean loving your neighbor part of that means with these great thinkers is that you present them uh, yeah you present the best of the worst you give yep. them you give them both barrels of Nietzsche yeah and then critique it but you make yep. sure that they understand them first before you start slamming them yeah absolutely I mean we are not I mean we teach two years of logic right and the classical right. education is all about oh we teach our kids logic nobody else does right well one of the things we teach them is that a straw man argumentation is illogical it's fallacious but we should be more strong and say it's a sin Right. It's a misrepresentation, and so so you're right. Yeah, we give them double barrels of Nietzsche, and say this. Okay, this is this is where he's most powerful. Now, how can we respond to that in a right. Christian way? So yeah, absolutely, no straw men. Yep. Uh, 
That's great. So what kind of student should we expect to see from a classical Christian education, do you think? What's the yeah, ideal? Uh, What's yeah. the ideal? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Well, I think it starts with something you mentioned briefly in the beginning, is that we have students who have their, you know, as Augustine says, you know, rightly ordered loves, you know, and so, and that's centered around loving God and, and loving our neighbor, mm-hmm. to be someone generally. But seeing that, uh, yeah, trying to train our students that they, that, that their first responsibility is to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul, and try to get them a picture as to what that looks like, but also loving, loving their neighbors as themselves as well. So I think good place is this rightly ordered love. I think in terms of you know loving God with their all with their whole mind with all their mind. I think yeah we're trying to we're trying to train learners people who love to learn. And again, it's not eggheads. It's not going off to wherever you know prestigious school. If that's if they want to do that, that's great. If not, it doesn't. I don't really care. Um, but it's people who love to learn. Um, love to learn about the world that God has created. The world that he's created is a gift. And right. it's a gift that God has given us to explore. And so we, will, we want to develop students who, who, ha- who have that, that desire to learn, whatever it might be. Right. Could be, could be whatever it might be. So I think that's one thing. But also I think we want, people, we want students who, can, who are winsome and uh, winsome witnesses for the Christian faith. Not a bunch of, you know, pietists who just want to kind of, you know, just say Jesus loves you and preach the gospel. And then, but that's it, right? That's not necessarily wrong with that, but if that's it, that doesn't go far enough. Right. So we want people who are able to understand the culture around them and bring the gospel in a winsome way, be able to translate that gospel. And getting back to Schaefer, I think that's what he was able to do better than, I don't know, many people that I've ever seen. He was able to translate the gospel in such a way that it could witness to the culture. And he was able to do that because he knew the gospel, the fullness of it, and he knew culture. And so he was able to translate the gospel into the culture in a way that was attractive. You know, if I could just talk about Libri again, I, I mean, I think a lot of people didn't, didn't get saved at Libri because they had these intellectual conversations with Schaefer, though I think that was part of it, mm-hmm. but that because as fallen as he was, and he was a fallen man, just like we all are, he, he formed a community where the, the gospel was lived out, and that was attractive. Right. So we want Christians who, who are students who are winsome in terms of their argumentation and things like that, but as well as in terms of their lives. So I think that's ideally what we would like for, for our students. Yeah. Actually, that's what I would like for myself. Yes. So. <laughs> Amen. So, so. And just to add one, one thing on there, I think sure. um, you know, Luther's doctrine of vocation mm-hmm. is, is huge. Just mm-hmm. that students are mm-hmm. equipped to find their place in the world and mm-hmm. that they work in that vocation yeah. toward excellence. Yes. Uh, you know, and doing doing the best work they possibly can. Yeah. Whether it's building bridges or yeah. translating the Bible or yep. fixing cars. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think too. Yeah, if I can just uh, add on to that, right? Just because that's the work itself is glorifying to God. They don't right. have to build bridges to spread the gospel. They don't have to be an artist so that they can, you know, paint. I don't know some cheesy picture that's supposed to, you know, depict heaven or something like that. No, you just be a good build, uh, uh, bridge builder. Be a good artist. Be a good farmer. Be a good academic. Be good. That's what God has called you to. And as Luther rightly pointed out. We glorify God in that. We don't have to spiritualize it. Right. It's, that's good. God wants us to do that. Right. So it should be enough that we do it well. Yeah, and by doing it well, that tends to lead to opportunities for the gospel, like yeah, you said. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So. Well, great. Well, Greg, I know you're working on developing this talk into something larger. Yeah. What can yeah. you tell us about that? Uh, probably not too much. I would like <laughs> to develop a lot of, a lot of this because it's just... You know, I think the lecture, the original lecture was maybe, I don't know, 50 minutes long, maybe a little longer. And I mean, that's not even scratching the surface of, right. of any of the things that we talked about here. So it'd be nice to be able to develop it into something more of a, of a book. But we'll see. Time is, uh, is uh, my time is restricted. So sure. but I would love to be able to do that um, at some point. Um, so hopefully in the future, that'll that'll take place. Yeah. So. Great. Well, um, if people have questions, where could they get a hold of you? Email? Yeah, email. It's uh, Greg V, G R E G G B 66 at hotmail.com. Yep. So you can email me there. Yeah, that's right. three G's. That's two, three G's. Two aren't enough, right? G R E G G V. 
and yep. I'll put I'll put that in the video so people can see it. Okay, uh, Greg, thanks a lot. That was a great uh, great interview with you. And uh, if you're interested in, in hearing more of this talk, uh, click on the link below. Any last words? No, thanks, Sam. I appreciate your work and uh, I appreciate your blog and all the things that you're trying to do. And I hope uh, you know I can contribute a little bit to that. And and I, I hope and I pray that people will uh, start to be, come to your blog more. I think you have a lot of wisdom to, uh, to, to offer. So thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. God all bless. Right. See, ya. See ya. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Be sure to check out the resource links below for more information. Before you go, I want to remind you one more time to sign up for my free email newsletter. Don't miss out on two great eBooks and some great lectures. Head over to samconan.com slash subscribe and sign up today. Talk to you soon.